Welcome to our second New Mexico Listens event. New Mexico Listens is a joint project of the New Mexico Humanities Council and the League of Women Voters. There are three League of Women Voters chapters that are participating. There's one in Southern New Mexico, one in Central and Santa Fe County in the North. All of us are funded by a grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities. Tonight, we're going to continue our listening. And our continuation is, as most of you know, Santa Fe stories you've never heard. This is a live stream event that is being recorded. The film of this evening's Santa Fe stories will be available on the New Mexico Humanities Council website through their YouTube channel. It will also be available on the League of Women Voters Santa Fe County website. Tonight, you're going to be meeting three Santa Fe residents, each of whom will share their unique story. Storytellers will speak one at a time. They'll speak without interruption, questions, or comments. But of course, we will have time to talk this evening after we listen. There is a live question and comment period that will happen here. We have a small live audience. And then on the webinar, for most of you who are on Zoom, you will be able to put your questions and your comments in the Q&A section on the webinar. I'm going to introduce our three Santa Fe County residents in the order in which they're going to speak. Seated the farthest from me is Max Quintana. Max is a senior at Capitol High. He's a lifetime Santa Fe resident and he's been in the Santa Fe public school system since kindergarten. Max is active in voter registration and civil engagement at Capitol High. He's a leader at school and he also runs on the cross country team. He's been interviewed on KUNM, sharing his views. He offers us a student's perspective on Santa Fe and Santa Fe education, including the enormous challenges during this time of COVID. Seated in the middle is Pat Gurule Griego. Pat's a lifetime Santa Fe resident whose family ancestry reaches back hundreds of years in Northern New Mexico. She's raised two highly successful children, one a curricular teacher coach, both at Santa Fe High School and Capitol High School, the other a diplomat with the US State Department in Liberia, West Africa. Pat's retired from a long career at PERA in the state government. She's a graduate of Loretto Academy. In retirement, Pat has devoted intense time to her art, specifically straw applique. She's an annual exhibitor at the Spanish market and she's earned both an honorable mention and a judge's choice award. And our speaker to whom I'm standing next to is Kevin Bowen. Kevin has lived in what lived in Santa Fe in the late 1980s to the early 1990s. He left Santa Fe, but he returned in 2017. He now runs a fitness business, Core Dynamics, which offers Pilates classes. Kevin is also the director of the Human Rights Alliance in Santa Fe County. Human Rights Alliance advocates for the right of all Santa Feans to be treated with dignity and respect. The HRA also leads the organizing and the outreach for the annual Pride Parade in Santa Fe in June. HRA is especially dedicated to supporting the LGBTQ plus community in Santa Fe County. This is a diverse group of Santa Fe folks. They're your neighbors and we're going to begin with Max Quintana. My mother, father, and I were born and raised in Santa Fe. I am the oldest of four boys. My brother's names are Philip, Jeremy, and Camilo. When I was younger, I was seen as hyper and distracted. And as a result, I had to repeat kindergarten. The following year, I attended a new school with a new teacher. Her teaching style was more effective to my way of learning, and I was much more successful the second time around. In fact, I excelled. That's why it is important for students to have a good teacher to set them on a positive path. My mother worked as a pharmacy technician for Del Norte Pharmacy for many years. 
However, due to my grandmother's failing health, my mom quit her job to stay home and take care of her. My grandmother was suffering from cirrhosis of the liver, which was brought on by years of alcohol abuse. In fact, addiction is something many people in my family have struggled with. Taking care of her mother and the stress of raising three boys took a toll on my mother's mental health. My mom wanted to protect us from the things she was dealing with, with which made the difficult decision to send us to live with her grandmother. I was about eight years old at the time. My great grandmother, Elizabeth, was in her 60s when she took us in. She had just retired from Santa Fe Public School System in food service. Taking on three boys and soon after a newborn baby must have been difficult for her, but she did what, her best and she was amazing. She always made sure that I kept up with my schoolwork and that I participated in school activities. She provided me with everything I needed or wanted, and it's because of her that I am who I am today. She continued to raise us to the best of her ability, and the years passed. Addiction was never far from sight, and unfortunately, my great-grandfather, her husband, struggled with alcoholism. At the beginning of my teen years, he became sick with sepsis and even spent time in the hospital in a coma due to his drinking. When he was released, he went through a lengthy rehabilitation process. He made the decision to stop drinking for the better of his health. This was a difficult time for me, and school was welcome div div diversion from the struggles at home. In eighth grade, we didn't have a history teacher, and we went through many teachers, and I soon became aware of how this impacted my peers and I. I started speaking with my teachers and other students who encouraged me to push for change. I reached out to the superintendent and our concerns and was invited to share my perspective. She was receptive to what I was saying and asked me to share ideas and other solutions to help solve the problem. After this, I was invited to join the superintendent's diversity and equity council, and I remain on that council to this day. The council is designed to bring students and teachers together to discuss current issues in the school. This led to more opportunities like being part of the New Mexico Public Education Department Secretary's Advisory Council. I am honored to represent my peers on these councils. As everyone knows, March 2020 changed everything. COVID brought many challenges to us all, both at school and at home. As a student, it was very difficult, but like all of you, I had to quickly adjust. Social distancing, mask wearing, hand washing, etc. Living with two elderly grandparents, I was especially careful to avoid getting them sick. But unfortunately, in November of 2020, my grandmother Elizabeth began to experience weakness and shortness of breath. Being the strong woman she was, she insisted she was fine. On November 11th, I drove her to Presbyterian Hospital, not knowing at this time that she would not come back home. She was diagnosed that day with COVID-19 as well as pneumonia. She contacted the family to share the diagnosis, and soon everyone in the house also tested positive for COVID-19. It was extremely difficult knowing we could not be with her as she suffered with this horrible illness, while we were also fighting it at the same time. We used technology to say our goodbyes, and she passed away virtually surrounded by family and loved ones. My grandmother Elizabeth was the matriarch of the family. Her passing brought great sadness to our family and many people who knew her. She was like a mother to everybody, and she loved unconditionally. She taught me many great things about being caring, accepting, and how to be a good person. Thank you. Thank you, Irene. My name, my full boy name was Patricia Ann Teresa Gurule. I was the last child of seven children born in Santa Fe to devout Catholic parents who believed in Catholic education. My five sisters and I attended Loretto Academy and my brother went to St. Michael's High School. I attended Guadalupe Elementary and then went on to Loretto Academy in the seventh grade and graduated from there. Loretto was a great experience and a wonderful all girls school. The sisters of Loretto were great teachers, mentors and friends. They were not only strict, but when need be, they were fun on the playground and ate lunch with us. They would actually join our baseball teams or push us on the swings, you know, whatever, whatever we did. We mostly took our own lunches, but then on special occasions, they would serve us lunch and we had prior notice of that so we could take our money for our lunch. 
I'm sure we had the best cafeteria food in Santa Fe. On first Fridays, which is a very special day, we would attend mass and after mass, they always served us sugar donuts that they made there in the convent. And uh, those are the best donuts I've ever eaten to this day. I grew up in the time when most Catholic churches had parochial schools and there were many in Santa Fe. I also took classes at the College of Santa Fe and accounting classes at UNM Los Alamos branch, which were available through my state job. After working 31 years for, for the New Mexico state government, I chose, I pursued another career in banking. I was there for 13 years. While working and raising my daughter and son, I studied oil painting and silver jewelry making part-time, but my life was devoted to my children and making sure they received a strong education. They both attended the Santa Fe Public Schools and Santa Fe Prep for their high school years and went out of state for college to earn their bachelor's and master's degrees. Spanish market was always inspiring to me. I visited summer and winter Spanish markets yearly and knew many of the artists. Several of their intricately made bultos, retablos, straw applique pieces are in my home parish, Santa Maria de la Paz, of which I am a founding member. I served on their ad hoc building committee of the San Jose Chapel that's in, in the parish. In addition, some of my artwork is in the San Jose Chapel and in the gathering space at Santa Maria de la Paz. My daughter and I carved and painted the prayers on the beams and we carved a corbel, which is on the ceiling of the chapel, which contains a rosary and symbols of my sons, daughters and my patron saints. Uh, for instance, uh, St. Patrick is my uh, patron saint. So I carved a uh, shamrock. And my daughter's patron saint is St. Rose, so we put a rose. And my son's uh, is St. Mark, so we put a book uh, for, because he's an evangelist. I have been inspired by artwork in all the countries that I've traveled. I've traveled with my church to Ireland, Israel, Italy, Spain, Portugal, Greece, Poland, and France. I, we also traveled to South America, to Bolivia, visiting my son in the Peace Corps and have traveled to China and Thailand. However, at Spanish market, the straw applique art always caught my eye. One of my Christmas gifts from my daughter many years ago was a straw applique cross made by Paula Rodriguez, who was instrumental along with her husband, Eliseo, in reviving this Spanish colonial art form in the 1930s. I studied that cross and wondered, how is this even possible? One day while I was working at the bank, my good friend showed me what she had done over the weekend. She had seen a straw applique demonstration at winter Spanish market and made a cross of her own using the techniques she had learned. I expressed to her that I had always admired the straw art and would love to learn. She invited me to her home and gave me um, a demonstration. We began to experiment with straw and were amazed at what we were creating. We both felt very comfortable with it, but at the same time, it was very challenging. We had straw and glue all over us. We are both now traditional Spanish market artists. After retiring from the bank, I was ready to start yet another chapter of my life. I continued to pursue my art, but never dreamed that I would be a Spanish market artist on the plaza, along with the many award-winning artists I knew. I even think they were surprised. When people would come to my booth, they would start talking to my daughter, asking her questions about the art. She would politely tell them, you have to ask my mom, she is the artist. What's, what was amusing too, is that because of my age, people would come and ask me, are your eyes okay? Are they still good? And are your hands steady? People realize that the art is very intricate and a precise process. 
Fortunately, I am blessed that God gave me good eyesight and good health and of course, patience. Also, one of the award-winning market artists had seen my um, had seen my art and encouraged me to jury in to the market. I reluctantly applied and was accepted. My dining room table is my workspace. I light a candle and say a prayer, asking God to guide my hands as I work. Often I listen to religious music, which puts me in a very calm and peaceful mood. Because of my strong faith, I am confident that God is with me and allowing me to express and create my designs in this beautiful art form. I was surprised when I was awarded the Paula and Eliseo Honorable Mention Award by the Spanish Colonial Arts Society. Only three awards are given in this category, so I was beyond honored. In 2019, I also was awarded the Judge's Choice Award on my Jerusalem cross at the Ayer Hoy y Mañana exhibit at the Las Lunas Museum of Heritage and Arts. I also was invited to a show to show some of my Jewish art, Star of David and Menorahs, at the Festival de Judeo Español at Nahalat Shalom in Albuquerque. But of course, my biggest accomplish accomplishments have been my children. I always encourage them to study, do well, make good grades, go on to college, and see this world we live in. They both have done that. Thank you. <laughs> Am I next? Yes. Yeah. Well, let me just begin by saying um, thank you to you both. Um, I am not from here originally. I was born and raised in Tampa, Florida, just to give you a little background. Um, I attended Catholic school from kindergarten through 12th grade and then a public university. Uh, but it was during the years that I moved from Tampa to New York City, uh, I met um, someone who worked for me and she introduced me to Santa Fe because her parents had moved here. And as things turned out, um, I was just laid off from a job that I was working in in um, New York City. And I said to her, she just graduated from college and a, a girlfriend of hers, I said, I'll come with you. I'm gonna move to Santa Fe. And I did on, I made a decision in a week and did it. I got out here and uh, stayed with her parents who were very kind uh, people that came from Connecticut. Jack was a retired uh, Yale professor. So that's where uh, there's a couple of things that happened the first time and then a couple of things that have happened this time that has kind of pieced together my story. So I was working on the plaza downtown with uh, a, someone who was a little younger than me, but she'd been Fiesta Queen and was from a local family. And we were talking about going back to school. And I said, gee, I would really like to go back to college and take a couple of courses, but I don't have enough money to do that. And she said, well, you're white, you must have money. And <laughs> I said, that was the first time that I'd really realized white privilege, I think, but I just I was taken aback. I said, well, do you think all white people have money? And she said, well, yeah. And I said, oh, okay. Um, and we were very friendly at work. So it was just kind of an interesting take on what happened or people's views here or in, anywhere really for that matter. Um, and then to go back to my friends who lived here, they were like a second family to me. So every Thanksgiving and Christmas, I was at their home. Jack, being a retired professor, um, always had what in Spanish, because I lived in Miami for many years, they said a sobre mesa, which is like talk after dinner. But because he was a you know professor, he would pose a question and everyone had to answer the question or say something. And one meal, it was about, it was a Christmas dinner in 1991 and some politics were going on and I can't recollect what, but I was saying my opinion on it. And then they, he said, well, let's all talk about that. So he proceeded and said, okay. So was, I was like the third person and he said, so Kevin, before you go, before you can say anything, he goes, did you vote in the last election? And I said, no, I didn't. And he said, well, you have nothing to say next. 
And that really, of course, busted my male ego up a little bit. I was embarrassed. And then I thought at that point, well, I'm never going to say that again. And from that moment on, when I was 31, I think 32 at that point, I decided that I would vote in every election. So that was uh, an interesting story because I just had never thought about it. I thought about politics, but nothing really. So then I've lived in many other places besides here. I moved from Santa Fe to San Francisco, then to Miami, back to New York again, then to Boulder, then to Denver, and then finally here. So I've been all over the place. At this point, when I came back this time, for whatever reason, um, I wanted to participate in gay pride because I'd always participated in gay pride being a gay man and living in all these different cities. So when I came here, pride really wasn't much of anything. The celebration seemed really quite disorganized. And uh, I forgot what year that was. It was 2017 or 2018. So I thought, well, well, it's not, you know, it needs to be better. I'll get involved. And so the next year I put my name down and I said that I would volunteer to work for Pride and I was contacted and having had a background doing lots of organizing for big national conferences and so forth, I thought, oh, I could really be helpful. And then as it turned out, I ended up being voted on the board. And then within six weeks of being voted on the board as the vice president, I became the president because the current president resigned. Um, and at that point, I decided my fate must have been set for me. So now I was the president of the Human Rights Alliance in Santa Fe. And I had, uh, in my opinion, a duty to not only put on pride, but to speak up for those who are less fortunate or don't have a voice. Um, and through a course of time with my other career, which is teaching Pilates, because I started the Association for the Pilates Method in the United States some years ago and we created the national certification exam, I was quite involved. Um, they, that organization, which I left, had a problem, problem with equity and diversity, and it started with the George Floyd issues. And it turned into a, a nightmare that they should never have allowed to have happened. And having been the founder, I got drawn into it. And I decided that I had to do something. And I have now, because of all of those things and the circulation of events, I have become a very big advocate and ally for the Black, Indigenous, people of color, the LGBTQ community. So I have really come full circle from the moment when I said I had a political opinion but hadn't voted to the moment that now I'm sitting in front of you telling you that here I am. And, uh, and then the other thing that I think is really important is that I knew I would always come back here from the first time to the second because it, there was something in my heart that I felt here. And I traveled a lot for my job up until COVID. I used to run around training people to become instructors. But every time I would get to the top of La Bajada Hill and look down, I would be like, I'm home. So I love Santa Fe. Thank you. And so now is the time, if you resonate with one of these stories, it would be the time to say so. If you have a question, I know I have some of one of our speakers, this would be the time to answer. And I'm going to give special privilege because in these times to get somebody out on Sunday night on a really cold night in a time of COVID, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, there are 10 of us in the room. Four of us are actually working on the program. But um, <laughs> I would like to give a special privilege if there's anybody who's actually sitting here now, if you have a question for any of the panelists, if you'd like to make a comment, if you think well done, just anything that you might like to say to one of the panelists. Is there anybody who has a word they'd like to share? Please go ahead. I really appreciate what you're doing and coming here and telling your stories because it's so important to hear these things and to get an insight into other people's lives. And uh, I just am really happy to hear this and I'm really glad to be here. 
Thanks. Me too. <laughs> um, and it's quite, it's not easy to do what these three folks are doing. That um, well-prepared, articulate, not hesitant, in front of complete strangers, and then an audience, which is many times over the people who are sitting in this room. Anybody else who'd like to make a comment or a question? Yeah. Did we get the last comment? I hope we got that last comment. Very kind. Anybody who'd like to add a comment? Well, I have one um, for you, Max. And I'm wondering, your story is was moving. It, the, the solidity of your family was a beautiful story. And the courage of you and everybody involved. I'm wondering about your senior in high school now. Can you say something about what you imagine your next step might be? Um, I think I'm going to try and pursue a career in nursing. That's something I have a passion for. I mean, with the work that I've done in school, I've been told that maybe I should become an educator. Um, maybe I'll do something along those lines with my nursing career. It just really depends right now. And we're still facing some of these challenges. That's why I'm on the Diversity and Equity Council. We talk about, it's not just about a lack of teachers. It's, we ask questions, does this specific group of students need help? Does that specific group of student, students need help? So my work with that's kind of, you know, I've thought about it more, maybe becoming an educator instead of going into nursing. But it's definitely a plan, you know. I can also do it along, you know, with that, so. And then I'm also now on the New Mexico Public Education Department's um, Secretary's Advisory Council. And that actually consists of students from all over the state, whereas the Superintendent's Diversity and Equity Council is only Santa Fe. And I'm one of two students on that. And I think there's a teacher from Capitol High School on that. Can't remember her name. But I'm looking forward to working with those students from around the state to see their perspective, not just in Santa Fe. Glad I asked the question. There's a lot going on there. A lot going on there. That's, that's okay. Um, I think if I unmute myself, they can hear me fine. Ah, okay. So the first question is, how does Santa Fe surprise you? And I guess that's to all three participants. How did it or how does it? Either way. Okay. Answer easily, either way. I think I'll start. Okay. Santa Fe surprises me. That's the question, right? Santa Fe surprises me because there's so many different people from all around the world, all around the country. And you can usually find a group of people who have similar interests to you. Um, who share the same ideas with you. So that's what surprises me about Santa Fe. Well, for me, since I grew up here, um, born here, grew up here, never left here. Um, at, at, you know, when I was growing up, it was probably what, 30,000 people in Santa Fe, 35,000, you know. Now it's up to almost 80,000, I think. And before, when you went to the grocery store, you knew everybody in the grocery store. You knew the checkers, you knew the baggers, you knew people that were shopping. You went to a gas station. People came out and knew exactly, they knew what your car needed, what kind of gas you used, just everything. They knew everything about you. Now I go to the grocery store, I do not know a soul in there. I look and I'm like, who are these people, you know? Where am I? I feel like I'm out of town. Um, so that's what's that's been different, you know, for not only me, but for everybody else that grew up here. Uh, well, I, when I first moved here, when I was much younger, um, it pleasantly surprised me because being a gay man moving here from New York City, um, I felt very welcome. 
um, that was really a nice thing by everyone uh, that lived here, which was exciting. Uh, and then I also realized what a small town it was because I did go through a breakup that everyone found out about. And someone came up to me and said, I heard about that breakup you went through. And I said, well, where did you hear that? And they said, in the checkout at Albertsons. <laughs> that was when Albertsons was Sprouts. But yes, that's how it surprises me. I have another question here from the Zoom audience. And I think maybe this one's this one's for you, Max. I think maybe you answered it in part, but maybe you have something to add. What directions do you want your future to take? Well, like I said earlier, I want to continue my I want to continue helping teachers and students in education because since middle school, it's just been hectic. And for some reason, there's always been teacher shortages, and we've always struggled. And experiencing that in the classroom, I wanted to make a change, not only for myself, but some of the kids that I you know, go to school with, because not everybody has the resources and the ability to do certain things without help. So I think that it's very unfair for students who, who are scared to speak out, who are afraid to go and tell the principal, well, you need to get us a teacher or so-and-so is gonna happen. So I think for my future, that's what I wanna continue doing like just helping other students, helping teachers. Um, and I think that my career path headed in another direction, but I wanna try and um, work those two things out together. Don't put your mask on yet. Okay. Another question for you. <laughs> Please give an opinion on the legislation bill that includes allowing 16 year olds to vote here in New Mexico. Well, I was actually in the paper for that. I think my opinion on it is that if a, I think, I don't know, it's kind of complicated. I think that we should allow 16 and 17 year olds to give their opinion on it um, as a group or as individuals. It just depends. And I think if, if you really want to do it, if you really have a passion to speak your mind, then I think you should do it um, instead of just staying behind and continuing to let the problems build up until it's too late. Because students in the classroom, they're the most affected by um, what's going on. I mean, some people on the school board know, some don't. I, and I think that parents who are on the school board who have students in the classroom, that they should talk to them and ask them what they think about it and what they think that they could do to help make it better, maybe. Thanks, that, that leads to a, a comment, it's a good segue. The comment is, I like Kevin's story about being called to task about not voting when he was 30. I will remember that one. I may use it on someone. <laughs> Anything you wanna to add to that, Kevin? <laughs> um, I, I, uh, it, I, think it's, um, I think it's important, I don't know. Um, it, we live in times where we all have to participate. And uh, if you don't participate, um, you know, some people would say you're part of a problem. Um, and I would encourage everyone, I don't care how you want to vote. I'm not here to tell you that. I'm just here to say, vote, get out and do it and uh, talk about it. We don't have enough discourse anymore about any of these things, really. I mean, look what he's doing in school. I think it's such an important thing that's happening right there. And um, getting kids involved in this is so, so, so important because um, they need to make a comment, have something to say. And everyone else should pay attention to what's going on with the kids right now. I, I just read an article saying, all of us need younger people as mentors, all of us old people. So that's my advice. <laughs> I have another question here. How, does, how has white supremacy in New Mexico affected your life experiences? Whites in power versus our own native cultures. That's for anyone that would care to answer. Let's get all three. So the question is, how does white supremacy 
Could you repeat the question? Sure. How has white supremacy in New Mexico affected your life experiences? Um, personally, I don't have much to say on the matter. I mean, I am Hispanic. Um, I've been told by many different people that sometimes they're discriminated because they may be Central American, South American. But I just, I don't really have much to comment on the issue because I haven't really experienced it firsthand. I, I probably feel like uh, like Mike. I I've been retired. I'm home. Um, I'm in my own group of people. I do meet a lot of people from you know out of town or that have moved here, and I have friends that have done that. But I really haven't experienced anything personally. I just see what's on the news and on television. That's quite a loaded question. Um, white supremacy wouldn't necessarily affect me in New Mexico, um, but it is there is an effect of it in New Mexico, I think. Um, and part of the effect is, is that the most important thing I think we all need to do is kind of learn history a little bit. And it seems right now that history is getting twisted around and um, and there is, has been a push now, I don't know if it's gonna go through in legislation to ban critical race theory in the school system here. And no one even understands what it is when people talk about banning it. It's just bizarre to me that that would be the case because we all have things in our family's history that maybe we weren't so proud of. Um, and, you know, I just recently started to trace my, the Bowen side of my family. And I realized how long my father's family has been in the United States. So my assumption is that we own slaves. Um, and that's something to think about because my dad didn't know all of those details. On my mother's side, I'm only second generation Sicilian. So there is an effect here because there's a, a, there's a systemic racism permeates the culture in the United States. And I think people are, it's, it's such an emotional thing for so many people that if, if people can just talk about it, and understand and, and get a grip of what has happened, I think it would be much better. And I think a place like here in Santa Fe with such an ultimate diverse culture, we're the perfect place to have those things start to happen. But maybe I've already spoken too much right now, but that's my opinion. I have a question for Pat and Max. <laughs> and the first one, I think I'll ask Max. So you, you've gone to public high school mostly. Yeah. So I don't know what you know about private high schools, but do you think private high schools have had shortages of teachers like the public schools have? I, I don't think so, but I could be wrong. That's just my opinion. I know that it's, it's really tough for new teachers um, in public schools because you're dealing with a bunch of different students. Some students are rowdy, some are quiet, they like to do their work. It just really depends. And I, I've spoken with, um, with the superintendent about like why we're not having teachers come to the public schools. Um, one of her one of her comments and concerns was the price of living here. Uh, I'm not one to say that a private school teacher might have more money than a public school teacher, but that could be the case. But I just think that it's harder for teachers, especially here in Santa Fe, to make that transition because there's all kinds of different things. Um, speaking from experience, um, I'm in Spanish two this year, and our teacher. Um, I guess something happened with her paperwork. It was lost like in a district office or she didn't have the right things. 
So I think it's like stuff like that, like shortages, like the public schools. I mean, Santa Fe public schools is big, I'm sure. And I don't know, maybe a private school has better staff to like do clerical work and stuff. But I know that from experience right now, there's a math teacher in my school who teaches algebra one. We sit in her class every day for second period because she has to sit in as a substitute teacher. So whatever work we do, she has to grade and then it gets loaded off onto other teachers. So it creates like this big imbalance and some teachers are overworked, some aren't. So I think that's just my opinion on it. Okay. I just want to just say this is like the follow up to the white supremacy uh, question. And I want to ask Pat Griego, who happens to be my mom. Um, when you went to high school, who got to go to college? Actually, I, um, there weren't that many um, Anglo children that I graduated with, but of course they went, um, but their parents had money. And I think the sisters at Loretto um, didn't really talk to us a lot about college because they knew our parents couldn't send us to college. I really think that was that was the main reason. Do you have more questions? First, I have a comment. Thanks for sharing these stories. Do you feel comfortable talking with people who might judge your experience negatively? Do you try to avoid difficult conversations? Anyone who would like to answer that? Um, the question was, do you feel comfortable talking with someone who may judge your experience? Exactly. I think I would feel comfortable talking with somebody who might judge my experience. I know that the way that I've experienced life has helped me, um, I guess, better, I don't know, just experiencing, experience things better than I probably would have if I would have sort of fell onto the addiction in my family and stuff like that. If somebody disagreed or judged my experience, it's their opinion. If they really want to, if they want to look past the positive aspects of it, that's fine. Um, not everybody's going to agree with your experience or agree with what you have to say, but you can't let that determine what you're going to do tomorrow, what you're going to do in a week or a month or a year from now. What matters is that you've experienced it and you know what you went through. So at the end of the day, the person who disagrees with you, they can disagree with you, um, but that shouldn't change your mindset. That shouldn't change what you're doing now. I don't think I'd feel uncomfortable. Um, probably what I would do is go back at them probably with the same question that maybe they asked me or the same um, statement. I would put it on, on, on their lap. Um, I've made quite a few people feel uncomfortable um, because I, have a firm position that I take on certain issues, especially when it comes to equity. And um, it, sometimes it's uncomfortable because some people are very hateful and you can just see it in their eyes if you're disagreeing with them. Um, but sometimes we all need to squirm a little bit in order for us to um, move to a new place. So I kind of feel like right now, what for me, um, when we have these difficult conversations, it's okay that I make people squirm because maybe I'm the only person doing that. And maybe they'll throw daggers at me or maybe they'll you know, call me whatever they're gonna call me. I don't know, but um, I, I think it's important. I, I really do. I think it's very important to stand your ground and, um, and have discourse that's, congenial, but clear, and um, to the point. Thanks. One more here so far. Um, it's addressed to the two native New Mexicans. Did you learn English in school or did you start school knowing English? You wanna go first? Go first. Did they really ask that question? 
Um, I personally knew English when I started school, but my older sisters who are uh, 14 and 15 older than I am, they all they could speak was Spanish. So they were forced to learn English. Of course they had to, because you know, the schools were English teaching. But when my two older sisters went to Loretto, um, they were banned from saying any word in Spanish, speaking Spanish, and they grew up speaking Spanish. I didn't. Um, they were banned from speaking Spanish at the school because the school had borders at that time and borders came from all over the states. So you could, you know, they couldn't speak. But um, the young, are my sisters younger than them, we all learned English because English was supposedly the language of the United States. So we weren't really allowed to maybe Maybe I'm saying this wrong, but I didn't know Spanish. My parents didn't teach us Spanish speaking. I learned it just by listening to them, but I still can't carry on a conversation in Spanish. Um, but my older sisters did, did see that, did experience that. How did you feel about that? I think it was terrible. But at that, but when I was young, I was the youngest child. Didn't matter to me. But you know, now that I look back, I thought that was terrible that people here could not speak their own language. Thanks. I wanted to answer the question. Personally, I English is my first language, but I do know that there are many people in my family, um, as far back as my paternal grandmother and her mother, Elizabeth, who I mentioned. Elizabeth, she had nine siblings, and I believe they all spoke Spanish. Um, but when I was younger, I, I really wanted to, to speak Spanish, but my family, they didn't really teach my mother or I Spanish. So now, now that I have the resources, I've uh, gone on ancestry, I've traced my lineage. And right now, um, through experiences like work, and I have friends who speak Spanish, I um I try and learn Spanish. I'm picking it up. I'm not terrible. I'm not great in it, but at least it's something that I want to learn because my first name is actually Maximiliano Manuel Jose Quintana, and I have two brothers who just have English names like Philip and Jeremy. Um, but I do have a brother named Camilo, and a lot of times when people meet me, um, they think I just speak Spanish because of my name, but I speak English too. And I encourage people to learn Spanish because like Pat said, some people didn't want to speak Spanish because it was frowned upon. So with me, uh, I'm trying to learn Spanish. Um, I don't discriminate against anybody who speaks Spanish. I think it's great if you speak multiple languages. And today, I mean, the United States is changing. I work, uh, I work in the public and I meet a lot of people with, who speak Spanish. That's the first thing that they speak to me because my name tag, obviously. Um, and I try with those people, I try not to discriminate against them just because they speak Spanish. I try and get out of my comfort zone and, and talk to them and help them the best way that I can. Thanks. Um, for everyone, in your opinion, what do you think is a major threat to our democracy? Or what do you think is hurting our democracy today? Kevin, maybe you should start. <laughs> Well, there was probably a couple, but uh, the misinformation, disinformation uh, campaigns that are happening on social media. And <clears throat> what I always go back to is also public education uh, and standard education. I think that if um, the school system was better funded, to enable everyone who's coming through school to understand just a basic course in civics and how you get active and involved and to also not take everything that you read as truth, to try to do your own research. Those are probably the most important things in my opinion. I agree with Kevin on all that. Um, I know there's a lot of 
like he says, things on the media that somebody's it's somebody's idea. It's not the really truth, the real truth. So I think you just have to do research and just do a lot of reading on it. I have sort of the same idea as Pat and Kevin. Um, I know that misinformation is a big thing. In fact, um, I made the mistake while I was at work of telling my landlord that I was getting my booster vaccine and they immediately went crazy. They, they, they told me that I was putting bad things in my body and that I should just, you know, it was crazy. And, and I know that in my opinion, they don't always get their um, information from credible sources, but it was, I was really offended because they knew who my grandmother was, obviously they, they're the landlord. And I was really offended that, that they would say something like that. And, and I kind of regretted telling them. So now that I usually, when there's people I know that disagree with me in my family or friends, I usually just keep my opinion to myself because it's hard to get through to them. Um, and I know a lot of my friends now, like in high school, there's a lot of misinformation. They, they believe whatever they hear. They don't get other perspectives from it. And it's just, it's crazy. I see one more question here so far. Who are the people you count on when you have to do something hard? It's the person you go to? Yes. Who are the people you count on? Um, I say the people that I count on would probably be uh, some of my family members, like maybe my grandfather. But the people that I count on most uh, are probably my teachers. There's certain teachers in my school who know me very well. I mean, <laughs> I could be a minute late to class and they wouldn't send me for a tardy pass. Um, and there's some of my teachers that, that I know very personally that I've talked to who have, you know, helped me get out there and make a change. Um, one of the people I count on is probably my English teacher, my AP English teacher, Ms. Carthy. Um, I think my economics teacher, Mr. Braden. They're people that you can talk to and, you know, they'll give you their honest opinion. They'll tell you what they think is wrong and what they think is right. The people that I would go to, of course, when I was younger were my parents, especially my mother. Um, my dad was deaf. My dad uh, graduated from the New Mexico School for the Deaf. And after graduation, he stayed there and worked there. He was the maintenance man there. But my dad was just full of history. He loved history. So he would talk to us a lot about history. I personally never learned the sign language because he would, he would talk to me, but he would talk really low. You know, he, he was able to say words and, and actually to speak regular words, regular conversation, but very low, you really had to listen to him. But when you talk back to him, you just had to yell so he could hear you and he could hear you. Um, so actually it, it was them that I went to. And then later on, probably my two older sisters, since they were 14, 15 years older than I am. And today, it's my, my children. I just feel they're smarter than I am. They have more education than I do. So they, I feel like they know everything. <laughs> Certainly when they were alive, I would say um, my parents. Um, and now I would say my partner and uh, a couple of very close friends, which I'm really lucky to have, but that's who I count on. I don't see any more questions here, but I will just say that my heart is full. Thank you all so much. It's for the artist, uh, Mrs. Griego. Um, how did you find yourself making straw applique um, menorahs and stars of David? Uh, it, isn't that a Spanish craft that's pretty closely related to Catholicism? It's, it's actually, um, I, I was, I've always been enamored with the Jewish religion. I always loved the Star of David's. I loved, you know, their, 
their celebrations, what they did in their religion. But also I learned um, about the Sephardic Jews who came from the old world, from Spain. So when they moved to the new world here, they practiced in, uh, in secret, in secrecy. So um, I did check my DNA. And in fact, there was a, one man that came to my booth and says, why do you have all this art? Are you Jewish? And I said, as far as I know, no. I said, but I've never checked my DNA, so I don't know. And he said, you must be, have a little bit of Jewish in you since you do this art. And I said, well, this art is in my heart. And um, so a couple of years later, I thought, I'm going to check my DNA. And sure enough, my mother was, her maiden name was Romero, which was is big in Spain, was big in Spain and still is. And I think I had like 2% of Jewish in me. Is there anybody else who would like to put in a last comment or a last question? Well, I thought you were amazing when I was recruiting you and trying to talk you into this, but you are three amazing people. You've you've given of yourselves tonight with such generosity. And they're definitely Santa Fe stories that we have never heard. And I think you've certainly inspired Rakan and Irene. We need more Santa Fe stories that we've never heard so that we can keep on learning. Thank you so much. Thank you. You can give them a round of applause. We're live. Oops, there's one more question. I didn't know that. So this will be our last question. Any thoughts on how we can renew confidence in our institutions and strengthen public engagement in civic life? Individuals and institutions can work together to strengthen democracy. I think I'm going to pass on that question. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was just going to say, I'm not even sure I can answer that question. I don't think mm -hmm. I'm able to answer that question. That, that answer would be like, a thesis, I would assume at this point. Um, I, I just, I, I, I think I could keep going back to though, maybe if we make it a little simpler and just get more and more people involved, it's too bad that um, we've had this whole deal with COVID and we couldn't even sit with each other and talk because, you know, excuse what I'm gonna say, but the bullshit that happens online and all of that, people will, you know, take you to task and spew horrible things. But when you're face to face, those things don't tend to happen. And you usually can accomplish quite a few things. So my hope is that we have constructive dialogue that takes us to that point. Thanks so much.